Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 61 of Compliance Into the Weeds, a podcast where, with my good friend and colleague Matt Kelly, we take a deep dive into a compliance or compliance-related topic. Today we go off in a little bit different direction, discussing a U.S. District Court opinion by Judge Young, entitled, or rather in the decision of United States of America versus Ageron Pharmaceuticals Company. In this case, Ageron was assessed a $6 million fine for some uh, marketing, pharmaceutical marketing violations, and was in front of the court on what's called a C plea agreement. The court not only rejected the plea agreement as completely insufficient, but went on in a very lengthy and interesting opinion to lambaste the differences between corporate and individual prosecutions the lack of accountability and resolutions, and generally take a view similar to what Jesse Eisinger did in the Chicken Chip Club. It's a fascinating opinion, well written. Matt has blogged about it, so we're going to take a deep dive into this opinion. I think you will find it interesting, fascinating, and very enlightening going forward. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist, back with Matt Kelly, founder and editor of Radical Compliance, for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. Today, we pick apart a judicial opinion by Judge Young in the case of United States versus uh, Azurion, or something like that, pharmaceuticals, where it has the opening line, let me see if I've got this straight. And I can't tell Matt if the opinion goes downhill from there or uphill, but it is a classic um, pissed off trial judge opinion. So you want to set the stage for it? Yeah, this this one is great. Um, you know, you you hear about these opinions that are laced with originality and frankly, a, a rather fun literary wit. This is definitely one of them. So here's what was going on. Um, we had a case, U.S. versus, versus I believe it's Agerian Pharmaceuticals. Uh, I'm going to call it Agerian. Uh, U.S. versus Agerian. Agerian is a pharmaceutical company based here in New England that had tried to sell high cholesterol medications. Uh, it was called Juxtapid. And uh, Agerian took Juxtapid to market in 2013. Uh, this was carried, it was for high cholesterol caused by a rare genetic defect that resulted in an annual price tag Agerian was passing off at in the neighborhood of $300,000 a year. This was in 2013. And almost immediately, uh, the company also then began a series of deceptive sales practices. Um, and this is not good stuff. Uh, Agerian was promoting Juxtapid to patients who would get no value from it, and in many cases actually suffered more liver uh, complications and damage uh, because of taking Agerian. And of course, meanwhile, somebody who was often the U.S. taxpayer through Medicare and Medicaid uh, was paying for Juxtapid, 300000 a year. So what happened is that the Justice Department winds up pressing charges against Agerian for all of this activity which led us to this case, led us to a hearing last week in Boston District Court where Agerian and the Justice Department had put forth a plea agreement, apparently known as a C penalty, as in ABC. And Tom, you might know better than me what different types of penalties are, but essentially this was a plea bargain. I, I didn't know it was called a C penalty, uh, that Judge William Young only had the discretion to either accept this plea bargain or to reject it entirely. He did not have any discretion to modify the agreement or question, where did this agreement come from? Why did we agree to these terms, but not that terms or anything else? Um, so that's the scene, which then led to his really extraordinary opinion that he issued on November 20th, which turned into this 24-page diatribe against corporate plea bargains, because he said, number one, uh, many times judges have really no ability to exercise any oversight 
And in theory, we do have a third branch of government here known as the judiciary, and they are supposed to exercise oversight, but he can't. He could only accept this plea bargain or reject it, and he didn't like that. Uh, And then his opinion uh, later on went into what he saw were heavy-handed abuses and two tiers of justice in the United States, where if you are a corporation, you can buy your way to a plea agreement uh, that generally, you know, is might be expensive. It might be onerous for all these investigations that you put forward and whatnot. But um, there's no trial. There's no charges. There's nobody goes to jail. Uh, but if you are an individual, on the other hand, you don't get the plea bargain option. You get a guilty verdict you're going to have to cop to, as most individuals in federal court do. Uh, and then you're at the mercy of what the judge and the prosecutors decide to do with this uh, guilty plea that you have. But there's two standards here. And Judge Young was – he admitted that he never really stopped to think about it before, that um, – He has no independent authority to review corporate plea bargains, and really they are a separate private class of justice that corporations get, which individuals do not. I'm not doing enough justice to the flowery language that Judge Young used. As you said, his opening lines were, let me make sure I got this straight. Then he was quoting uh, Shakespeare, as in, I think he said, Asian plea agreement, how do I dislike thee? Let me count the ways. Then he quoted a country singer known as, um, what is her name, Margot Price. I have to admit, I don't know who Margot Price is, but he quoted her. He goes back and forth. He references uh, President Trump, referring to the justice system in the United States as a laughingstock, which I think the president said that last week or the week before. Hard to keep track. But really an extraordinary outburst from a federal judge just apparently fed up with his powerlessness in corporate plea bargains. And that's a long-winded scene setting, but that's where we are. So I do have to push back on a little bit of this, Matt, because some of the frustration uh, that the judge felt or had, I thought um, really related to more than simply this this C plea agreement. And I have to confess, I'm not a, a criminal law expert, so I don't quite understand that, except as with your explanation, it's really an up or down whether he accepts it. Um, the agreement that was reached between their parties could have been uh, sustained and explained if uh, the parties had chosen to do so. So he pointed out that the sentencing guidelines had a range of fine between $18.5 million to $30.9 million. Um, mm-hmm. yet there was a proposed fine of $6.2 million. Uh, we, we see this... Um, type of reduction in FCPA cases, but typically we have at least some explanation in the deferred prosecution agreement, non-prosecution agreement, or other agreement, which explains why the uh, uh, there was a downward swing. And there may have been uh, reasons that we're not aware of. Um, because the, of the, the nature of the C plea agreement, I guess that did not have to be presented to the court. Uh, so the simple fact that a company got what appears to be a good deal could be a multitude of reasons. It could be uh, extensive cooperation, could be remediation, yep. uh, could be, I think, uh, the um, old management got thrown out and new management was brought in. So it could be a variety of reasons. Um, so uh, on, that, on that note alone, I didn't find that the judge's uh, language completely persuasive. Nevertheless, it was extraordinary. It, first of all, it's always extraordinary when a federal judge writes with such language. Uh, but it was also mm-hmm. extraordinary for his uh, just lambasting of a two tier justice system, which is not, once again, not something we see from a federal judge. And I don't want to completely tie it to uh, Jesse Eisenberg's book, The Chicken Chick Club. But yep. um, it's it's another face of the same problem that Eisinger uh, raised. And you, in your blog post entitled Corporate Plea Bargains Under Fire Again, really list at least some of the reasons that we have these types of agreements uh, between uh, prosecutors and corporations. Um, there's not an unlimited amount of money for prosecution. There's not an unlimited amount of money for the juris- 
uh, the, the judges, uh, the third part of this system. There's not an unlimited amount of money even for corporations to remediate everything. So there's going to be negotiation. There's going to be give and take. There's going to be some good and, and some not so good. Uh, that's all a part of the plea bargain system. But to have a judge really lay this out and lambaste the difference in uh, individual uh, and corporate prosecutions, that I thought was really extraordinary. You know, he actually he did make mention of Jesse Eisinger's book, The Chicken Shit Club, um, in a relatively praiseworthy way, saying, you know, he's on to something because Eisinger in his book and Tom, you and I have talked about this before. Um, you know, he says that basically the Justice Department has retreated from prosecutions and Young clearly feels that the retreat leaves the judicial branch at a loss for any significant way to exercise its oversight. Uh, you are right that there may be some extenuating circumstances in this case because a lot of the details apparently are under seal, which tells me that somebody somewhere is still a target of an ongoing criminal investigation somehow related to this. Um, but you know, for the compliance officers listening, Judge Young did say that it seems like Azurian's new management um, have been giving extraordinary cooperation, have done all of the remediation we would like to see. And he said that it may even be, if he saw all these details, he would say, this sounds great, company's making a good effort, great compliance program, let's go with the deal. Um, but he can't see that, and he's got no ability to say, I want to see some of it, or I want to see what the logic is. Pros Execution in the company basically said, nope, you're out of luck. Um, take it or leave it. Now, for the record, uh, Young decided to leave it. He did reject the plea bargain, which he is entitled to do. So apparently this is going to go to criminal trial unless, I guess, maybe they reach some other sort of proposed settlement in the future. I don't know. Um, but, you know, I've, I've got some mixed feelings about his talk about um, individuals having far less power to achieve a favorable result than corporations. Um, he's not wrong, but like, dude, go to a Bernie Sanders rally. What do you think that Bernie Sanders and his voters have been complaining about for the last two years? And many people, including Bernie Sanders, for many years before that. Um, I do not think it would be news to anybody who gets paid by the hour or, frankly, anybody with dark skin or low education who winds up in the criminal justice system that system ain't fair to somebody with no money. On the other hand, if you're accused of criminal misconduct and you have a billion dollars laying around, I'm willing to bet the deputy attorney general will return my call and talk about how I might get a plea bargain. And maybe it's just a matter of a fee, which is what corporations do. Um, my big thing, what I would love to know, I'd love to know what the deputy attorney general Rod Rosenstein thinks of this opinion, um, because – Rosenstein is running around these days giving many speeches talking about the importance of the rule of law. Um, and in a practical basis, that's not really how this country is working these days, not at the top level with Donald Trump and Attorney General Jeff Sessions, but even in the mechanics of it. Uh, there's not a lot of rule of law. There's a lot of plea bargains. And then we never get to trial to figure out what the rule of law should be because that's what the judges are supposed to do. But they don't get that. Um, and I know that Rod Rosenstein allegedly is talking about reforming the Yates memo in practice. He's not going to do that uh, because the Yates memo encourages cooperation, which is what he wants. And then the executive branch can pick up the ally, which would be the corporation that's charged. And the two of them together get to basically stonewall the judicial branch and say, this is what we want. And you don't have the authority to say otherwise. Um you know, it's a pretty powerful tactic. It's been common for the last 10 years at least. Judge Young doesn't like it, but we also have a big record of judges when they do try and do an end run around this, they get slapped down. Um, so I, I appreciate Judge Young bringing this to the public realm, and I think compliance officers should read his opinion. If for no other reason, then it's a really good, interesting opinion. But I don't know that he's going to really move the needle all that much. Um, that's kind of where we are. So one thing that is a little bit different about this plea agreement, Matt, is it was a criminal matter. And the two mm -hmm. cases that 
federal district judges were royally slapped by the Second Circuit uh, in Judge Rakoff in the Citigroup case, and then Judge, um, well, I forgot the second judge, in the HSBC monitorship case. Those were both civil matters brought by the SEC. And in the Second Circuit held that the mm-hmm. trial judge had no jurisdiction, or excuse me, no authority to uh, accept or reject. Um, he simply had to rubber stamp. Here, at least, the judge yeah. had the opportunity to accept or reject, which, as you correctly note, he did reject. So uh, perhaps the parties will come back with something more to the judge's um, uh, persuasion. Uh, but in the in the criminal world, it looks like it's a little bit different than in the civil world, where literally judges they don't even maybe even saying they get to rubber stamp something's too much. Uh, because they have been royally shut down uh, by the Second Circuit, at least. The, the, I remember when you and I have talked about that case, that Second Circuit opinion, I was surprised that it didn't have a post-it note on it back to the federal judge saying, and don't let the door hit you on the rear end on your way out. I mean, that was a, a harsh shoot-down of a district court judge. Um, I, I, I get the sense, however, here that Judge Young isn't really complaining about the terms of this agreement and I think if they came back and said, we're not going to go with 6.2 million fine, we're going to go with 9 million and a monitor. I don't think that would placate the judge at all because he's really saying, show me your homework. I want to see it. And he's not allowed to see it and they're not giving it to him. And that's not going to change if they did decide, OK, we'll we'll include a monitor, which this proposed agreement did not. Um, that was another point that Judge Young brought up is that he lamented that he had no ability to have an external person, independent, review the compliance uh, performance of Ajirian from now forward. Um, you know, really what he's saying is that he wanted a compliance monitor and he doesn't get to choose that. Um, you know, I'm also struck that this is the sort of thing that British judges do get to do when they are looking at plea agreements. And I yeah, I mean, it, we should loop in our British friend, Jonathan Armstrong, see if he had a better insight as to how judges there have been handling DPAs and NPAs when they're accustomed to a more active role. But Young clearly seems to be thinking, I want to do what the British judges get to do that you don't get to do in this country. Um, and like I said, he's not wrong to raise the question, but I don't know if he's just shouting into a void or not. Well, I was going to say, is he shouting into a wind tunnel? not a void. Yeah. So. Uh, it's, um, it, it is an interesting question and he does go through and cite several other judges who have re- rejected C pleas, um, on similar grounds. And he also does make mention of judge Rakoff who did get slapped down by the second circuit, but you're right. That was a civil matter. And, you know, there's a little bit more discretion here, but you know, like fundamentally, it brings up yet another point about do how much really do we have rule of law in this country? Um, clearly, Donald Trump does not care much about what it is. Um, it's not a point that I think Jeff Sessions is terribly interested in because he just wants to spend all his time rounding up criminal gangs and illegal immigrants. Um, Deputy A.G. Rosenstein seems to be talking kind of a good game about the rule of law. He throws out the buzzwords, but on a practical basis, is he really going to embolden the judicial branch the way that Young talks about, which would disempower his executive branch to be able to do what it wants? And for all the corporate compliance officers, again, listening, you know, where Judge Ray, uh, Judge Young is talking about, you know, it's a shame that we can't administer justice more effectively here. Let's call a spade a spade. Corporations are not people. They are not interested in justice. Corporations are legal constructs. They are interested in certainty so their operations can grind on for another day. That's not the same as justice. I don't see where any corporations would really disagree with what Rod Rosenstein is proposing or what uh, how the system works right now that basically they can buy their way out of a criminal plea or a criminal charge. It's expensive. You don't like to do it. But you really want to make this a jump ball with a federal judge who might have very different ideas that you can't predict? No, you don't. Um, so th- there's a lot of moving parts here, and it's just a fascinating case to kind of call it all out for what it is. It certainly is that, Matt. 
So we've been talking about the uh, opinion of Judge William Young in U.S. versus Ogeron Pharmaceuticals. Matt has blogged about it. We'll link to uh, not only his blog post, but uh, the judge's decision. I hope you'll take the opportunity to read it. It uh, really is fascinating on many different levels. And uh, I think this is one that we will be able to continue the discussion on, Matt. Thank you, Tom. Good to talk to you again. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. If you've listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast. It would help in our rankings and also help get the word out about the only podcast which takes a deep dive into a compliance or compliance-related topic each week. Also, if you have any questions, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. You can email Matt at mkelly at radicalcompliance.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode, and I hope you'll join us again next week where we're going to have a very special one-week podcast series on the new RevRec rules. It will be very instructive for you going forward. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.